so after um, the questions yesterday, I, I was asked several times what is the observational indications of significance or proof or whatever of uh, gravitational particle production. And uh, I thought I would give a better answer than I did last time. And a better answer is that I believe we already have proof of gravitational particle production. And the proof is visible in the microwave background radiation and the initial seeds that grow to become structure. So those can be understood as gravitational particle production during inflation. So if people ask, you know, in case you want to know, everything that we see in the universe is the result of gravitational particle production, is the result of quantum effects. So without quantum effects, if we set h bar equal to zero, there'd be nothing in the universe, no structure. So uh, I like to tell people that you are an amplified quantum fluctuation. Good? That makes you feel good, right? You are an amplified quantum fluctuation. So let me um, describe a little bit how that would work in its connection to gravitational particle production. During inflation, if you do not take perturbations into account, the universe would end up being perfectly smooth, no temperature fluctuation, no density fluctuation, so you would not have the initial seeds that grew through gravitational instability to form galaxies, stars, planets, people, etc. So we understand the origin of structure uh, because gravity is a free market force. It's a free market force in the sense that the rich grow rich at the expense of the poor. It's the ultimate capitalistic force. Regions of the universe where there's a little bit more density, the density is a little bit higher, suck things out from regions of the universe where the density field is smaller and the perturbations grow to become galaxy structure, etc. And the origin of these seed perturbations trace back to gravitational production during inflation. Okay, so let me uh, take a couple of minutes to describe how that would work. Uh, since we've already, we are now experts in scalar fields and gravitational particle production, I'll just outline a few steps and then you can fill in the steps for yourself. So it's usually considered that inflation is driving, driven by an inflaton, which is a scalar field that's minimally coupled. So it's a minimally coupled scalar field to gravity. And it's also usually assumed that the mass of the inflaton is much smaller than h during inflation. So there's a classical background evolution of the inflaton field. You know, it rolls down the hill, et cetera. And there are perturbations in the inflaton. And let's call the inflaton field phi. I think that's what I call it. Is the classical evolution rolling down the hill, plus some delta phi. Now, in addition to the perturbations in the inflaton field, there's also perturbations in the metric field. So there's perturbations in g mu nu, uh, so g mu nu is going to be equal to some background field and some perturbations, let's call it h mu nu. Yes? I'm sorry? 
there is no a priori reason to say the inflaton field is a scalar field that's minimally coupled with the mass smaller than that. If, um, if it is, would be a vector field, then there would be presumably some orientation, it would break spatial orientation if you give it a vacuum expectation value. And why it's minimally coupled? Because that's what works <laughs> to uh, produce the density inhomogeneities that we see. So this is just a phenomenological description. It encompasses all the things we want from inflation. Doesn't mean it's right. So for the um, um, perturbations in the metric, I'll introduce something that's known as an SVT decomposition. And this stands for scalar vector tensor. So this is going to be an SVT decomposition of H mu nu. So the reason this is good to do, and the scalar vector and tensor describes how various quantities transform under spatial rotations. Okay? So in an FRW space-time, The S, V, and T, the scalar vector and tensor perturbations of the metrics decouple. So we can trace separately the evolution of the vector, scalar, and tensor components. All right, so um, let me just do some notation here. So H. So the, the metric, the background metric, is just the FRW metric, and in you know conformal time, okay, we've seen this before. Now um, H zero zero, I'm going to write as a squared times e. E is a scalar. It's the zero, zero component. It's the scalar. H zero I is always going to be an A squared. I'm going to write as the divergence of uh, uh, the gradient of a scalar plus a honest to God vector. And um, with the requirement that the vector is transverse. Repeated indices are summed over. So I don't have to have them up and down. I'm going to be a little bit sloppy here. So repeated indices are summed over. And Hij is going to involve several terms. Again, it's going to be an A squared. Delta Ij times A plus di dj of a scalar b. These are scalar perturbations. a and b transform like scalars. Uh, derivative of, it will be a, a divergent, a, a, a transverse vector, but since i and j are symmetric, I'll write that, plus uh, an honest to God dij. And the vector components are transverse. Oops, yeah. Uh, but, but, how do I want to write this? D I C I is zero. And uh, this tensor is transverse and traceless. Too many Ds. 
and the trace is and it's traceless. So in general, like this is the SVT decomposition, I can write any tensor like this, in particular the perturbations of the metric tensor. Uh, and there's the uh, zero, zero component. So th th now there's a bunch of uh, functions. There are scalar functions E, F, A, and B. There are functions that transform like a vector. Uh, there's G and C. And uh, the functions that transform like a tensor, the dij. Good. So we know what the action is for the for the uh, metric. It's the Robertson. It's the uh, Einstein-Hilbert action. And uh, now, if you let's first look at the tensor components. In the tensor components, the action, uh, the tensor components will be simpler to look at in some sense. And uh, this does not have a canonical kinetic term because of the A squared. So just as we've been doing for scalar field theory, we're going to redefine a new um, uh, scalar field, which has a canonical kinetic term. And let's call it chi ij. And in terms of the chi ij, the action for the perturbation, the tensor perturbation of the metric is d eta d3x. There is a canonical uh, kinetic term. And, you know, a delta kl and then spatial derivatives. And a term that looks familiar, that's plus a squared r over 6 times chi. So you see this is looking like the action for a minimally coupled scalar field. A minimally coupled scalar field that's massless. So this looks like a massless, minimally coupled scalar field. Now, um, then we know what to do now. We do a Fourier decomposition, impose um, the correct commutation relations, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's traditional to write the Fourier components Since there are so many damn indices on this, the Fourier components I'll denote by a little tilde. The usual k, chi, the cross and plus polarizations. For a gravitational wave. Must be that. So it's traceless and it's transverse. And um, then you know we we know what to do. The mode equation for the Fourier 
e to the plus across will be the same. The second derivative with respect to time plus omega k squared chi. equal to zero and omega k squared is k squared minus r over six times a squared. So it looks like a massless minimally coupled scalar field. And the perturbations, the, met the tensor metric perturbations we know how to calculate, they're due to gravitational production, gravitational particle production. So there's gravitational productions of non-zero momentum, k not equal to zero modes of the, this, the tensor component of the gravitational field. So uh, <coughs> when you ask what is the observational indication, one observational indication would be a determination of gravitational waves or tensor perturbations in the microwave background radiation. Now this is just uh, lightning going through, leaving out a lot of details. I could actually give five lecture, five two-hour lectures on doing this, but I don't think I have to since you already have the idea of uh, quantum fluctuations in a scale, in, um, uh, quantum fluctuations in gravitational particle production. Now the scalar perturbations are a little bit more complicated. These are tensor perturbations. And now there are scalar perturbations. So for the scalar perturbations, there's two sources of the scalar perturbation. One is the perturbations in uh, the inflaton field itself, delta phi. Another source of scalar perturbations have to do with the scalar component of metric perturbations. So this would involve A, bah, 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 E, B, I think that's all, and F. Now, there are more degrees of freedom here than we expect in H mu nu. So let, let's do some counting. This is one. So the scalar degrees of freedom, one, two, three, four. Four degrees of freedom. The vectors, there are one, two vector degrees of freedom. So you would expect this to be six, but there are these constraints that they are, they are transverse. So this ends up being two. And uh, there's the tensor degree of freedom, which is transverse and traceless. So this is also two. So this is four, five, six, seven, eight. We don't expect that many degrees of freedom. How many degrees of freedom do we expect? Well, we expect 2s plus 1, which is 5. So there are three. This is a gauge theory. There's a redundancy of the description. So three of these things or redundant and can be removed. And this turns out that there is one gauge independent scalar degree of freedom. So for the scalars, there's a delta phi and uh, it's usually taken to be the degree of freedom that I've labeled A. And we can package delta phi and A together into another parameter, which I'll call R, is minus A minus H over phi dot. This is the uh, classical evolution times delta phi. 
and this is related to the um, uh, perturbations in, it, it, it's, it's something geometric that you can define. So this is what you want to define, and uh, you can define a scalar field U, that is A, delta phi plus 1 over H phi dot times A. And um, so U is minus Z times this R, co-moving perturbation. And the metric, uh, not the metric, the action for this And again, this looks like a um, the perturbations for a minimally coupled scalar field with uh, a certain mass. So again, we can go through the usual procedure that we've been laboriously going through, um, express it in terms of mode functions, quantize it, and uh, set initial conditions and watch particles being created. So this produces the scalar perturbations or the curvature perturbations which end up being directly probed by the CMB and isotropy measurements and uh, structure formation. So in fact I would claim that we do have evidence for gravitational particle production in what I'm doing here, in, you know, in, during inflation, and uh, it's in the CMB and the origin of structure. There are a lot of review articles written about gravitational particle production, about uh, perturbations from inflation in this way. Uh, there are books written about it. Little and Life wrote a book about it. There are reviews um, uh, that I could point you to. Okay, and, any questions? So you're excited that there is an application for all that crap I've been going through in the first three lectures. And of course, now I say, well, you know, if there's this application, maybe there's another, another field that gets perturbations. Yes. Yes. So the perturbation, the density perturbations that grow to become U eventually trace back to quantum fluctuations during inflation. That's why U and everybody else is an amplified quantum fluctuation. Oh, yes. I'm sorry? Right. Um, let's see. Did I do a counting wrong? So it, it, 10 degrees of freedom. One. Let's count this again. So every vector field has two degrees of freedom. You would expect three, but there's a condition here, right? And you have, oh, this is two times two. It's four. The tensor is two degrees of freedom. That's two. Oh, four, eight, ten. How about that? Thank you. I've derived 10. <laughs> 
Sorry, that's it. I have poor arithmetic, poor arithmetic skills. All right, now uh, enough about scalar fields. I promise we're going to do something other than scalar fields. And now uh, let's do spin one half fields, just Dirac fields. So let me remind you of the Dirac equation for a uh, free field, I gamma mu d mu psi minus m psi is equal to zero. One of the most beautiful equations ever written down, the Dirac equation. And here, gamma mu are the gamma matrices. And um, I probably won't directly say it, but uh, I will use uh, the, Dirac, the Dirac, Dirac matrices, the Dirac representation of the gamma matrices. If you want to use them, some other, the vial representation or whatever, uh, it will be slightly different, but the end result will be the same. All right, so there's also a uh, psi bar and the uh, field equation for psi bar is I d mu psi bar times gamma mu plus m psi bar is equal to zero. And this, these, the Dirac equation can be derived by very, and this is in Minkowski space, of course, uh, from an action, depending upon psi and psi bar, Okay. Now we go through, then let me go through Minkowski space a bit, and then I'll quickly jump to uh, FRW. Uh, then we want to make this a quantum field, and the fields are going to anti commute. So A here is the index on the spinner. must be a delta AB um, times D3 of X. This is at X, this is at X prime, the usual equal time commutation relations. And uh, the Dirac field for Fermi fermions will anti-commute rather than commute due to the spin statistics theorem. Now, what I would do is to write the field in terms of Fourier modes, just as we did for the scalars, D3K. In terms of creation and annihilation operators, Now, psi is not real, so psi dagger is not going to be Hermitian, which means they're going to be two creation and annihilation operators. Oops, B sub S. Uh, hat K. Okay, again, this is just standard Dirac quantum field theory. 
uh, A creates, A dagger creates particles, B dagger creates antiparticles. And define a vacuum that's annihilated by the A's and the B's. So the spinners, U and V, S, S refers to the spin. I'm going to choose U and V uh, such that we can write U and this again is just standard things as a UA and this is a, moment, a, a Fourier mode K of T and S U B S is plus one and minus one K of T uh, times the outer direct product of uh, the helicity there. And V And there's a phase that I'm just going to ignore. All right, so if we put this ansatz into the equation of motion, there's an equation of motion for UA and UB. I D by DT. I'll write it in matrix form, UA and UB. And again, these are the Fourier modes and its function of time. And I'll just define a, a matrix A as this. So this is equal to A times U. I suspect that most of you have seen this maybe uh, in a slightly different form or convention when you study quantum field theory or even uh, relativistic quantum mechanics. Now again, we are still in Minkowski space because I'm going to develop this in a little bit more detail in Minkowski space because it's simpler and then transport it into curve space, into FRW space. Now the eigenvalues of this matrix A is omega plus and minus, a plus and minus omega K, uh, which is plus or minus the square root of K squared plus M squared. Now we want to diagonalize A so that uh, we work in the basis that has the uh, plus or minus omega K. So we want to diagonalize A by a rotation matrix. Ah, uh, boy, we use a lot of U's. I've already used U. This is another U, uh, a unitary matrix 
just a rotation matrix such that u, a, u transpose is equal to uh, the di it diagonalizes. And in this new basis, the eigenvectors in this new basis, I'll call u plus and u minus, related to u a and u b. And it is a rotation matrix. Uh, what do I call this? Phi. times u a and u b, and phi, let's see, I haven't said what phi is. I haven't said what phi is yet. But we can look at the Dirac equation in the new basis. Uh, I'm going to do some uh, fancy u a's and u b's someplace. Well, I won't go through it. The Dirac equation in the new basis, the, the thing is that this is time independent. It just involves k and m. It's time independent. So in the new basis, uh, uh, i d by dt of u plus and u minus is omega k, the eigenvalues, omega k and minus omega k. u plus and u minus. So up to a normalization, the solution of this is u plus or minus is e to the minus or plus i omega t. So in this basis, the solutions are the positive and negative frequency modes. And again, so far, this is just in Minkowski space. And as we did for scalar field theory, we could say, well, we've uh, taken this as the orthonormal basis. Oh, I guess one more thing I'll say about this is if you take another derivative of this equation, it is a wave equation as expected. So we could choose another orthonormal basis. Rather than the u's and the v's, we could choose another orthonormal basis. Let's call it uk prime is alpha of k, u of k, plus beta of k, v of k, and uh, this is the Bogliubov coefficients looking at another basis, and the difference between the fermions and the bosons is now, because of the anti-commutation relations that are written someplace, alpha of k squared plus beta of k squared is equal to 1. This comes from the commutation relations, anti-commutation relations. For the bosons, it was alpha squared minus beta squared is equal to 1. Right. So I want to do one more thing, or just state one more thing. We have the field. We have the action we can take. In, we're just still in Minkowski space, we can calculate the stress energy tensor and calculate the trace of the stress energy tensor. And the trace of the stress energy tensor is m times psi bar psi. So 
So what is going to break conformal invariance here? It's going to be the mass. So if the mass of the fermion goes to zero, the fermion will be coupled conformally. There will be, there will be a conformal invariance, and we're not going to have gravitational particle production. Okay, everybody ready to go to Kurt? Let me give people a minute to catch their breath. Me to do some erasing, and we'll go to curved space. So this has been the first two weeks of introductory quantum field theory for fermions. So the thing that's going to be different in FRW is that the rotation matrix will be time dependent. All right. So let's look at the field equations in curved space. And I'm only going to look at it in FRW. So in Kotsky space, we had I gamma mu d mu psi minus m psi is equal to zero. Now we're going to promote this to curve space. So we're going to do this by writing a little line under the gamma and turning the, the normal derivative into covariant derivative. So we expect that if this is the Lorentz invariant expression of the Dirac equation in Minkowski space, this should be the expression in, uh, in general curve space. And uh, gamma mu, the space-time index is going to be carried by the Vierbein. And gamma alpha will be the usual flat space uh, Dirac matrices that we all know and love. And um, the covariant derivative uh, will be the normal derivative plus the spin connection. And I'll just, so this will be complicated in a general curve space, but in FRW, it's not so bad. E0, 0 is 1. Eij is a to the minus 1 delta ij. And the other ones are 0. So if you have mixed 0 and space, those are 0. So gamma 0 underscore is gamma 0. And gamma i underline is a to the minus 1 gamma i. And also in FRW, the spin connection for the fermions is sort of simple. Gamma 0 is equal to 0. Gamma i, maybe not so simple, is 1 equals 1 half gamma 0 gamma beta delta beta i times a dot. It's a good exercise to calculate these. It will give you some feeling of um, the uh, Vierbein formalism. So doing this, the equation of motion in FRW is I gamma zero D zero psi plus I eight minus one gamma I D I psi. 
that just comes from this part, um, <laughs> the, this part with that. And then there's the other parts. So it brings in H. So you obviously recover Minkowski space, ignoring the A. You can set A equal to 1 and set H equal to 0. You re recover the equation of motion in Minkowski space. <sighs> now, this won't surprise you. It's not a canonical kinetic looking term because of this H. So we're going to define a new spinner. I such that psi times chi. Now, uh, with this new definition, the field equation is d0 chi plus a to the minus 1. I'm multiplying through by minus i, I guess. Gamma zero, gamma i, di chi, plus i m, gamma zero chi. Now I'm going to go to conformal time. And in conformal time, and I guess I'll remultiply by i. Uh, I lost the gamma zero here. Sorry. It's I gamma mu d mu psi. Chi, sorry, psi chi. So I've gone through a lot of a lot of shit, a lot of stuff and ended up with something that looks like a Dirac equation, except for the factor of A in the mass term. Now I'm going to ask you to follow your nose. Is that an Italian expression? Is English follow your nose just... Okay. <laughs> Is there an equivalent Italian expression? Come on, you have noses in Italy. You know, follow your nose. <laughs> okay, so following your nose, you will. This you're going to look at this. You're going to quantize it. It has a canonical kinetic term. You can quantize it. So what are the steps? These steps are well known now. So we're going, how do we quantize it? We put a little hat over it. And uh, then we're going to expand in mode functions. After we expand in mode functions, this will define creation and, and annihilation operators. This is exactly what we did in Minkowski space. And we're going to define spinners. U sub k and V sub k. And uh, we're going to write this in terms of UAs and UBs. So we're going to just do the same thing, follow the same procedure, procedure that we did in Minkowski space. 
And what we're going to end up with is something that look, looks very familiar, very close to what we had in Minkowski space. It's been erased. The, the Dirac equation, I d eta, Now, these are actually Fourier modes. I'm just too lazy to write the Ks. Remember, we had the Dirac equation before, except so if we set A equal to 1, just ignore A. It's what we had in Minkowski space. So the eigenvalues of this matrix, this is some matrix A, which has eigen, A has eigenvalues. Um, omega K as plus or minus the square root of K squared plus M squared A squared. And again, just as we did in Minkowski space, we want to diagonalize A so we can express the um, Dirac equation in terms of the eigenfunctions with eigenvalues omega k. Omega k plus or minus is plus or minus square root of k squared plus m squared. And we're going to, so there's going to be some diagonalizing matrix U, UA, U transpose is equal to the diagonal of, uh, I'll say lambda plus, say omega plus and omega minus. All right, so let's, let's do a little fun. Now I want to diagonalize it, so what I can do is to write U transpose U A, U transpose U A, then I want to do U transpose U Because U of UA and UB is going to be the eigenmodes U plus and U minus. <clears throat> so let me do a little bit more fun. U transpose U is the identity, of course. is equal to this. Now, let me take, uh, multiply both sides by U. I can identify this as U plus and U minus. I multiplied both sides by U, so that's going to cancel this going to be an U A U transpose is going to be uh, omega plus and omega minus and U U A U B is going to be U plus and U minus. Ba -bum. 
now this is almost what we had before in flat space, but in flat space, the matrix that diagonalized uh, A was time independent. But now the matrix that diagonalizes A is going to be time dependent. If the unitary matrix is time independent, I could take this out and it, it would, this would give one and it would just give the flat space result. So this diagonal, this uh, unitary matrix, I can write in terms of cosines and sines. And now cosine phi is the square root of omega k minus k over 2 omega k. This is the square root of the whole thing. That's all I have to do. Sine, you can figure out from what cosine is using sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. Right. <coughs> now here, um, the time derivative, uh, conformal time derivative is going to hit u plus and u minus multiplied by u, plus, uh, u transpose, and it's going to hit u transpose multiplied by u plus and u minus. So this would be i d eta u plus and u minus. That's one term. Taking u transpose out is going to uh, set that equal to 1. Then I'm going to take uh, the derivative of this and turn it to the other side. But before I do that, I can write, I can write, so I'm going to have u times the derivative of u transpose. And, um, well, oh, let me just write S for sine. I wrote that, did I write down? Yes. Uh, so, ah, right here, sorry. times d eta of phi. So just taking the derivative of the unitary matrix. And we know what cosine theta is, so d eta of phi uh, is equal to d eta of the inverse cosine of this thing. And if you uh, do it correctly, which I may have done is one half h m k a squared and this looks familiar it's almost the adiabaticity parameter that we found for conformally coupled scalars in fact, it's k over m times the adiabaticity parameter for conformally coupled scalars. So packaging everything together, the Dirac equation 
becomes I d by d eta of u plus and u minus is omega of k minus a, and I'm going to define this as c of k. So in the course of evolution, if c sub k is not equal to zero, if the adiapaticity parameter is not equal to zero, during evolution, it's going to mix the positive and negative frequency terms. So if c k is zero, the solutions will be, the, the terms won't be mixed. Uh, this must be minus omega k. Um, you'd have the positive frequency turns remaining a solution. So it looks like a conformally coupled scalar, and the adiabaticity parameter is approximately equal to the conformally coupled scalar. So now if you go through and let's see what I want to, where can I find this? Ah, okay. Right. So if you would calculate Na cubed, the gravitational particle production of fermions, um, actually this is for a Majorana fermion, for Dirac you would multiply it by two, you see it's approximately that of a conformally coupled scalar. Mm, fermions, Dirac fermions are conformally coupled to gravity, so it's going to resemble a conformally coupled scalar. So I don't have to go through and look at solutions and this limit and that limit because I've already done it for conformally coupled scalars. It's almost exactly the same. So fermions would also, also be, Dirac fermions would also be a good dark matter candidate. We want this to be about 10 to the minus 5. There's uncertainty because we don't know the reheat temperature. We don't know H at the end of inflation, but you see it's similar to the conformally coupled scalar. Any questions? And this all traces back to the fact that the, there's a time dependence in A. All right, let's break for coffee and we'll come back. And now, this is easy. We're going to do spin three halves. That'll be a lot of fun. All right, now we're going to do uh, gravitational production of spin three halves particles. So we've done spin zero, spin one half. I will do spin one tomorrow. Friday is both, the, the, traditionally Friday is boson day. And uh, so today I'm going to stick with fermions and do spin three halves. So let me ask you a question, all of you are either graduate students or postdocs in, in physics, how many people have gone to a lecture about Rarita Schwinger fermions? Not many, three, okay. So um, this will be a little bit of an introduction to Rarita Schwinger fermions or spin three halves fermions. And uh, so I'm gonna do gravitational production of spin three halves fermions. And uh, 
Rarita Schwinger. I, I assume everyone's heard of, of Schwinger at least. And uh, th they did this in Minkowski space in 1941. So it's not a new idea. I uh, went to a lecture on Rarita Schwinger fermions given by Schwinger when I was in graduate school. And Schwinger would lecture with chalk in one hand and an eraser in the other hand, and he'd write like this. <laughs> you had to be really fast taking notes when Schwinger was lecturing, and he talked really fast too. It was, well, I didn't learn it from Schwinger. I should have, but I did. So the relativistic theory of a spin three half, relativistic quantum theory of a spin three halves particle was constructed essentially in flat space by Rarita and Schwinger in 1941. So there's going to be a Rarita-Schwinger field and it's going to be called psi mu. Uh, it is a vector spinner or if you prefer a spinner vector And uh, you, th the way they constructed it is they started with the direct product of the vector representation of the Lorentz group times the, uh, <laughs> um, times the representation of the Dirac field. And from this outer direct product, they uh, found, it, when you multiply things out, this contains 1 half 1 plus 1 1 half. And uh, that's the Rarita Schwinger field. Now, some notation. If you don't like manipulation of Dirac matrices, don't work on Rarita Schwinger fields. There's many, many tedious manipulations of Dirac matrices that I won't do, um, but it, it's, a, it's a pain. So in notation, I will define gamma mu nu as one half of the commutator of gamma mu and gamma nu. So the anti-symmetric thing. All right, so that doesn't look too bad. Then there's going to be gamma mu nu, mu rho nu. Another... Um, combination of gamma matrices. So if there are three indices here, it's various combinations of products of three Dirac matrices. All right, so according to Mr. Rarita and Mr. Schwinger, uh, the field equations in Minkowski space is something that almost looks like a Dirac equation, except more complicated. And then you can figure out what the Dirac equation for psi bar is. Now, let's think of degrees of freedom. For a massive field, we expect the number of degrees of freedom to be 2s plus 1. Um, so for a scalar field, S is zero, there's one degree of freedom for a real scalar field. 
for a fermion field, for a Dirac field, S is one half, so there's um, two degrees of freedom for psi and two degree of degrees of freedom for psi bar. Packaging them together in the spinner would be four degrees of freedom. Now, the spinner vector, vector spinner, if you just look at it, this is a space-time index. There's four of these puppies. So you would expect this to contain 16 degrees of freedom. But what we expect to for, for particles and antiparticles, 2s plus 1 is 4, s is 3 halves, we expect 8 degrees of freedom. 4 degrees of freedom for the, uh, for, for the particle, 4 degrees of freedom for the antiparticle makes 8, but here it looks like there are 16 degrees of freedom. So what does this tell you is just like in electrodynamics, there is a duplic duplicity, a duplicate, duplicity is another word, a duplication of variables, and not all the variables here are going to be dynamical. There's going to be gauge degrees of freedom that we can get rid of. And we expect there will be eight gauge degrees of freedom. And these degrees of freedom we can get rid of, again, I'm in Minkowski space. By noticing that gamma mu, if we contract gamma mu into the equation of motion, or maybe I'll, um, uh, that would end up being gamma mu psi, uh, yeah. So gamma mu psi mu is equal to zero. And that we can just see from uh, sticking gamma mu into the equation of motion. Another constraint another constraint is that d mu times the equation of motion is equal to zero, and this is equal to eta mu nu d mu psi nu. And of the same things you can, same stuff you can do with psi bar, and this will um, get rid of the unwanted degrees of freedom. Now using these constraints after tedious manipulation of gamma matrices of the gamma matrices, the um, equation of motion we can get to be I gamma mu d mu psi nu minus m psi nu is equal to zero. And this looks like four copies of the Dirac equation because nu goes from zero to three, it's space-time index. But the original four components of psi is reduced to two because of the constraint equations. So there are, um, right, so we can get the proper number of degrees of freedom uh, after imposing the constraint equations, 
and we will impose the constraint equations after we expand in Fourier modes. So we have the equation of motion. We can construct an action that gives us the equation of motion. It's long and sort of messy. And uh, from the, uh, and we can, ex again, we're following the same prescription that we've done again and again. We can write in terms of Fourier modes, psi sub mu, This is a Fourier mode of psi. Okay. And uh, right. And we can do the same thing for psi bar. And we can uh, find the equation of motion for the Fourier modes of psi. Oh, before I do that, I'm going to consider a single Fourier mode psi mu of k, and I'm going to choose it in convenience to be along the z-axis. Choose vector, that k vector, to be 0, 0, kz. So kz is the third component of k. <clears throat> so with that choice, the equation of motion for psi mu k is i gamma 0 d0 psi mu k minus gamma 3 kz psi mu k minus m psi mu k is equal to 0. So this is the equation of motion for the Fourier mode k, assuming that k is along the z-axis. Now, I'm going to impose the constraints gamma mu psi mu is equal to zero. This is going to imply that gamma zero psi zero of k right? So using this, I can uh, solve for psi 3 of k, uh, psi 3 of k, so we know we can uh, get rid of two of them. So here, oh, th this comes from so I can get rid of psi zero and I can get rid of psi three. So I've chosen a gauge in some sense that the dynamical fields are psi 1 and psi 2. Just a minute. Yes. Yes. In the parentheses... Here, oh, th this is one. No, no, this is gamma i. Sorry. 
Yeah, thank you. So I've made the approximation that gamma is equal to psi. So the dynamical fields are K1 and K2. Now, I could just work in psi um, 1 and psi 2. But what I want to do is to find 2 Um, orthonormal combinations of psi 1 and psi 2, which are helicity eigenstates. The helicity eigenstates of psi 3 halves and psi one-half. So I can construct projection operators to project out psi, th the different helicity eigenstates, the usual way you construct helicity operators. And rather than working with psi one and psi two, it's more physical to work with the helicity eigenstates. And the helicity eigenstates or psi three halves of k, and psi one half of k. Yeah, it's not some square square root of three halves. minus so the psi three halves and one halves are orthogonal and uh, I'm going to work with those as the dynamical degrees of freedom and I can use the constraint equations up there to express uh, psi uh, mu of k in terms of psi one half and psi three halves, the helicity eigenstates. All right. And there is a hellacious amount of calculation that goes in here. It's rather tedious. Um, you're welcome to, everybody should do it once in their lifetime, no more than once. So the equation of motions for psi one half and psi three halves is I gamma zero D zero minus KZ gamma three minus M. And I gamma zero D zero, my, it's the same thing. Now, I have chosen k to be in the z direction. The obvious generalization of this would be k dot gamma. So if I would have worked and made a lot more work for myself and just not chosen, made this simplification, I would have ended up with k dot gamma. This looks like ki gamma i. It looks like two copies of the Dirac equation for spin three halves and spin one half. So starting with Rarita Schwinger field, find the field equation, the action, etc. We have to look at the constraints because we know there are more functions that are dynamically relevant. There's a, there's a duplication. 
and uh, you do a lot of tedious manipulation, uh, expand in Fourier modes, find the equation of motion for the Fourier modes, and construct the orthogonal combinations of psi 1 and psi 2 that, that are the helicity eigenstates, and uh, find the Dirac equation, the Rarita Schwinger equation for the helicity eigenstates, and it ends up being the Dirac equation, or two copies of, of the Dirac equation. Now, I just could have started with this, I guess, and saved a lot of work, but uh, you see where it's coming from. Okay, any questions before we do something interesting like going to going to uh, a curved space-time and the FRW model? Again, we're following the same play that we did for the for the spinners. All right, so I just erased, I think, the Rarita Schwinger equation, but we can guess what it's going to look like in space time. I'll put a little underscore there a covariant derivative. Let me write these as capital Psi now because this will not surprise you. We're going to redefine the field to get a canonical kinetic term in FRW. So this is now capital Psi. And, you know, for every space-time index there, there is a E alpha A, A, mu, E, B, nu, E, C, oh, let me make it alpha. And each of this involves a bunch of combination products of gamma matrices. And we know what these are in FRW. We know what the spin connection is in FRW. Which I guess I erased there. And uh, so what does this look like at FRW? It looks a lot like uh, what you might expect. And the, except for all this extra stuff here, um, it looks like the Dirac, sort of sort of resembles the Dirac equation in curved space that we had before, right? The Dirac equation in curved space had a term that was something like this, a term that was the usual derivative there, and uh, a times m entered, whereas in flat space it was just m. So now what I'm going to do, we're going to again 
follow our nose, or follow my nose or something, you know, follow the nose. We know what we're going to do. This is not going to give us a canonical kinetic term for psi. So we're, and again, this should be capital psi, sorry. Capital psi up there. We're going to define, um, something to give us a canonical kinetic term, and we're going to work with this. And then we're going to go to conformal time. So we can find a canonically normalized kinetic term. So just let me mention, why should you care about Rita Schwinger fields? Many of you have led a very nice life never hearing about Rita Schwinger fields. Why should you care about it? Well, if you ever decide, if you ever wake up one morning and decide to study supergravity, you will find Rita Schwinger fields in supergravity. It's the super partner with the graviton. So if you want to study supergravity, I'm not advising you to, you understand, but if you want to study supergravity, you're going to have to face up to Rarita Schwinger fields. All right. <coughs> Just as in the flat space, there are constraint equations. And the constraint equations, let's see, did I write the constraint equations? Yeah, I guess I erased the constraint equations in flat space, but they're similar. Oh, thank you. The constraint equations in flat space for the Fourier modes. Uh, the trouble with the Fourier modes, this looks like a, a uh, space index, but it's not. That's the Fourier mode. Um, before, I think this was minus one, if I remember correctly, for the flat space. Now it's not minus one. It's something that's a little bit complicated. I'll just write it down, but it's going to be important. And let me add a term that you may not, well, I'll tell you why I'm adding it in a moment. A term that's proportional to how the mass, not the effective mass, but how the graviton mass changes with time. Because in supergravity, the gravitino mass evolves in time. So if you're just doing Rarita Schwinger, plain Rarita Schwinger, it's complicated enough, you wouldn't have this term. But uh, tonight, if you decide to do supergravity, you have to have that term. So this was minus one, I believe, in Minkowski. So it's not minus one here, although if you put h and r, ah, I see, if you put h and r equal to zero, this and ignore the derivative with, of the mass, it's minus one. So it's minus one in Minkowski, 
putting H and R equal to zero, we recover the Minkowski result. So we can So using this, there's another thing that will define C sub D. This is from the other constraint. Uh, what am I writing? We can use the other constraint, the second constraint, to write psi 3 in this way. And here, CD And in Minkowski space, CD was zero, and we would recover setting H equal to zero. Whoop, 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 whoop. Is it zero? A times M K C I H. No, it's C, it, uh, it goes to KZ over M, which was the result in Minkowski space. Now again, form projection operators for the Fourier modes, and we can find the, the mode equations, the equation of motion for the projection uh, for the helicity eigenstates, psi 3 and psi 1 half. And now the equations of motion So the, for the Three halves helicity, the equation of motion is exactly the equation of motion for a Dirac fermion. So the helicity three halves mode behaves like a Dirac fermion. Not so for the helicity one half mode. There's some more things. <sighs> There is this noise in here, whereas before this was just equal to one for the um, Dirac fermion. So I don't have to worry about the spin three halves polarization, it's just the uh, Dirac fermion, so I can, uh, I've already done it. And you've already seen it. But now we can do the spin three, the uh, helicity one half. And uh, I'm not going to be able to finish it today. I will finish it later. Uh, but it has, some, it, it, it's really cool what happened. So it, it turns out to be, finally, we'll find something interesting. 
So tomorrow I will pick up on spin three, finish spin three halves. I will do spin one, uh, De Bruyne, po Proca, Lagrangian. People have heard of De Bruyne, maybe not Proca. A massive spin one field, massive electrodynamics in some sense. I'll talk about how we can get this using a trick, the Abelian Higgs model, a trick uh, from a, where is it? Ah, from this person. Gee, is there someone from Switzerland who can pronounce this for me? Come on. Okay, well, he was Swiss, but go ahead. Imagine his name tag, how small the font had to be if he went to a conference and had a name tag. This, uh, there's a, something known as the Stuckelberg trick. Uh, that we will see in spin one that you might encounter also in uh, spin two fields and things like that. So it's some Stuckelberg trick. People have heard of the Stuckelberg. Okay, cool, cool. Okay. So we will encounter the Baron Ernst call uh, Stuckelberg trick. I'd also like to know his birth certificate rather than UE has umlaut. But he seemed to have lost the umlaut later in his life and stuck the E in. So I, I never know how to write his name. Okay, so tomorrow we will finish spin three halves. We will, we will at least do spin one. And I'll say some profound words about massive spin two. Okay, good. Thank you. And see you at 430. <laughs>